Well, welcome and good morning. It is good to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. If you uh, are here for the first time and uh, perhaps uh, either online or in person, I always say to you, you must know you're welcome, you're loved, you're safe, and that God is well pleased with you. Certainly our prayers this morning continue for the communities in Texas, California, New York, and Oklahoma, grieving the loss of a family member to gun violence, for parents burying their children, for children burying their parents and their grandparents. Even here, we pray for our youth directors, Andrew and Bridget, who are away in uh, Las Vegas with family grieving the unexpected loss of Bridget's sister, who leaves behind a 10-year-old son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You see, we, we gather today like it's another Sunday when around the country different families and communities are gathering not to be joyful, not to celebrate, but to mourn, to weep, to grieve. The book of Romans says that we should rejoice with those that rejoice and we should mourn with those who mourn. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit this morning can teach us to be those kinds of people, to be that kind of church. It was a, a lunchtime that I was uh, participating in. Everyone was ordering their main dish and it was my turn to order. So I ordered what everyone orders all the time, pork intestines. This was my first time ordering such a dish, but my friends around the table insisted that I order pork intestines, so I caved into the pressure and I ordered pork intestines. When this plate came out full of pork intestines, it was placed in front of me. I looked at it and I trusted my friends. I dug right in. I took the first bite. And right there in that first bite is where I immediately realized that I do not enjoy eating pork intestines. That it's not my thing. Now everyone around the table laughed at me because they all knew that pork intestines were a, was a unique, you know, Chinese delicacy. Not for everyone, but for some. I couldn't take a second bite. So I tell you this story, though, this morning, because there was a point in my life when I worked so closely, so tightly with people of Asian descent. They were from China. They were from Singapore. They were from Taiwan. And I intentionally learned some of their phrases, some of their words, some of their language. But in the process of learning their language, of learning their words, I began to fall in love with the people, with their foods, most of their foods, their customs, their days of celebration. And the more I learned, the more I felt like part of their family. And the more I learned, the more they became part of my family. There is something beautiful about learning a new language, a new culture, a new people, it's like one grows, one expands, one's love extends further than one can imagine. One's eyes are open to a whole new perspective. I titled today's sermon, Do You Speak People Fluently? Today's wisdom derives from the book of Acts. 
And this moment is a miracle moment. It is a supernatural experience that has arrived. A multilingual proclamation of miraculous proportions, shall we say. The sounds of howling wind filling the entire house, visible fire flames in the tongues of those who were gathered, and all in the room were filled with the Holy Spirit. Many languages spoken as the Spirit enabled. One theologian describes this moment as the breaking open of the divine. I mean, can you imagine with me the full presence of the divine entering the room, touching tongues, touching voices, touching minds, touching hearts. So unprecedented, so uh, anticipated, uh, so perhaps unwanted for the disciples. But yet the Spirit moved and decided to use different languages to speak, not so much to the disciples, but to speak to those who were yet to understand. The disciples were together. They were praying. They were seeking. And they received the untamed, overwhelming, unfathomable power of God. The advocate was, has, has come to them, on them, and with them. But do they even grasp what is happening? Do the disciples even understand what is truly happening? Because right here, in this space, is where wisdom enters the room. Here is where we invite the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor, the guide, the help, the intercessor, the advocate, the companion, to truly come and be with us this morning, to guide us and lead us to encounter the divine. Because today's wisdom is for those who are seeking to truly understand the power of Pentecost, the meaning of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, for those who are open to having their lives altered, changed, I would say to you, even translated, shall we say. And here it is, that Pentecost removes our desire to have power over people and replaces it with God's desire for people. Let me explain it to you. If one truly pays attention to the Pentecost moment, one can see that language is the method by which God's desire for people is revealed. Perhaps the divine is attempting to usher a new expansion, a new movement, a growth, a, an extension, shall we say. Is it to say that the feeling of the Holy Spirit is moving in the disciples to speak diverse languages? Could it be that God was ushering a new future, a future that would be shaped not by humans, but be shaped by the divine. But could it be that the disciples failed to grasp God's shaping of the future? Could it be that we have failed to grasp the understanding of God's future for humanity? There is something beautiful about language. It announces familiarity, connection, and relationality. But to learn a new language is not always an organic desire. It's not always something that organically grows within us. Why should it? Have you ever tried to learn a new language? It is hard. It requires repetition. It requires pronunciation. It requires submission to another person, to another people. Have you ever tried to learn Hawaiian? Because I have it, it's been such a humbling experience. But those who try to learn a language are always met with this crucial moment. This moment that attempts to learn a new language. And yet, 
when they realize it or don't realize it, they fall in love with the people, with the original speakers, the native speakers of that language. One begins to love more than the language. One begins to love the people, their foods, their faces, their customs, their songs, their poetry, their artistry. But also one begins to care for their struggles, their pains, and their injustices. To speak a language is to speak a people. God speaks people fluently. Could it be that the Holy Spirit has come in language with great urgency so to teach Jesus' disciples to speak people fluently as well? This is, I believe, the revolution, the miracle of Pentecost. God's invitation for you and I to speak a new language, to speak a new people. But here in this very moment is where the tension arrives. Because if you and I are honest with ourselves, we would admit quickly that we love to speak our own language. We would admit that we love our own foods and our own songs and our own customs, that it's way too comfortable. Why would we want to come out of that comfort to be uncomfortable? Why learn a new language? Why learn a new people? You see, I guess what I'm saying to you this morning is that God is way ahead of us. And we're just merely trying to catch up. That there has been in our history people before us, some our ancestors, who have taken language and used it for evil. Who have claimed to have the best language, the most uh, intellectual language, because all the other languages are not that intellectual. That somehow the language we have is blessed by God, holy and blessed, and that all the other languages, they're uncivilized. They're not as scholarly as our language. I mean, imagine learning a language not because you want to, but because you're forced to. You see, language can be used for evil. It can be used to oppress. It can be used to enslave. It can be used for evil purposes. Now, I know we don't like to hear that. But how many stories have we heard of people, of indigenous people, who have been tried to be removed of their ethnicity, of their color, of their language, of their culture. Been mastered over, been enslaved. Entire communities have experienced genocide. By all historians, that's what it is. Imagine such a thing. That sounds like the desire of humanity. Power over people. I wonder sometimes, is this why so many precious and beautiful communities continue to run from our churches? Black, brown, and indigenous communities missing from our congregation. LGBT communities missing from our congregations. Families with little kids who run around church missing from our congregations. Asian, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities missing. Young college age students missing. Could it be that perhaps they sense, they feel, they can perceive the same desire of people of church wanting power over them? And every once in a while, there's these communities that encounter a person, a church, a faith community, a neighbor, a friend, a pastor who will speak a language and will speak a people. Not to change them, but to be changed by them. Not to conquer them or to make them into Christians, but to be Christian among them. To be a sound for them. 
This is why I believe this passage gets to a point where the people ask, what does this mean? I don't know if you've caught it. I would say that the question could also be, what is God doing? Well, I believe God was pouring out the Holy Spirit, the advocate, to speak a new language, to speak people fluent. But is it even possible? Is it even possible to love a new people, to speak a new language? I come to say to you this morning, yes, of course it's possible. But it takes real courage. It takes boldness to reach across the boundaries that separate us, cultural boundaries, ethnic boundaries, religious boundaries. When we do this, though, this is what we would call neighbor love. When we do this, it is drenched with the Holy Spirit, enabled by the Holy Spirit to learn how we might refer to people who are different than us. There's this Chinese proverb, I told you I learned about the Chinese culture, that says to learn a language is to have one more window from which to look at the world. What windows are we looking through this morning? Could it be that we are failing to grasp the message of Pentecost? You see, Jesus, who speaks people fluently, demonstrates God's desire of love, of inclusion, of welcome of all people, willingly died on a cross for all humanity, took away our shame, our 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 mistakes, our transgressions, our inability to grasp meanings and gives us his forgiveness, his successes, and his righteousness. And he rose on the third day to give us liberation. And you would say, liberation for what, Pastor Rosie? You see, I would say to you, liberation to be molded, to be shaped, to be translated, shall we say to go out into this world, to speak a new language, to speak a new people, to follow after God's desire for humanity, to grow, to grow a heart for people, to grow a heart for others that are preferably not like us, that do not eat like us, speak like us, believe like us, think like us. Preferably for those who don't have the same skin color as us. You see, when we start living like this. Well, that's just another Pentecost flow. That's just a Pentecost flowing and overflowing. That's just like the rushing wind filling an entire room. It just overwhelms us. It fills us. And it makes us speak. Church, may we step into that in this season. May we remove the indifference that exists within us. May we be reminded that it's not our power over others, but it is God's desire for all humanity to be part of this church. Word of God and word of life we all say together, thanks be to God. Would you pray this morning?